theoretical perspective. Yeah, the last of all, G. This one is called postmodernism. Postmodernism is a perspective. Yeah? Now, this lecture is called Postmodernity and Sociology. So it's going to give you another set of theory. Uh, I have uploaded this. But today, the way we we'll do it is that we are going to just watch the DVD. Yeah? I have given you questions. As you watch the DVD, look for the answer. Yeah, I'm going to start watching now. These are the questions that you have to look out for. As you watch, you prepare to take the paper, right? Take a piece of paper in front of you. Otherwise, you may lose it. As, as you watch, you may just line up. I want you to actually pay attention to the DVD. These are the questions that I want you to get answered to me. After this time, I will pause it. I will go around asking the questions. Fair enough? Yeah? So, you don't have to listen to my own picture. This is, this tape is very interesting. Yeah, it is like, I think, 40 minutes tape. But after we pause, we discuss the material for a while. We will finish this before the break. And after the break, I'm going to show you a nice video of this, how to apply one topic for medicalization. And after that, we will get how to write essay for such a thing. So that next week, you submit your assignment. Yeah? The first assignment will go on theory. Okay, but we only do that after we finish this part on post mobility. So I'm going to just um, dim down the light so that you can still have, um, that have some light for you to write um, the answers. Is it okay if it's like that? Is it too dark? Is it okay? Are you still right? All right. These are five questions here. Yeah? When I finish it, unfortunately, I would, it would be good if I put, can put my PowerPoint beside and the DVD that side. But somehow I can't load the DVD into another one, so I only can load the DVD into my PC. So therefore, I will have to switch back and forth. Yeah? And sorry about that. <clears throat> okay. And this CV, I don't know how to, I don't know how to do this. Exit full screen. communication and collapsing cultural traditions. A media-dominated world where image, style and fashion are everything, especially fashion. Even sociology has fashions, and the latest one is called post-modernity. But this is much more than just another new theory. The post-modernists argue that sociology is seriously dated, and that a new set of ideas are needed to understand a new society. So do we really need to sweep all the old ideas away and start again? Postmodernism is an extraordinary challenge to sociology and to all disciplines which try to study society systematically. The main reason for that is that they challenge the fundamental notions of truth, of reality, and of reason. And without those three, 
you have no recognisable base on which to do any kind of systematic study. Postmodernism is a challenge to sociological theory. It uh, challenges some of the most fundamental assumptions in sociology. Um, it challenges the very idea that you can have uh, theories and explanations um, which are rationally based and which um, hold good in a wide variety of circumstances. So if that's what sociology is all about, then yes, it certainly proposes a very major challenge. <laughs> So is postmodernism an important challenge for sociology, or just a passing fashion? Well, postmodernity simply means coming after modernity. So our first question is what do sociologists mean by modernity? Well, I would say modernity means two things. It means, first of all, the emergence of modern industrial civilization. A civilization based on industrial production, the emergence of factories, civilization where most of the population moved from the countryside into the cities. Um, it's the world you see all around you, really, a world of manufactured products, um, a new type of society from the feudal society which preceded it. Well, I think sociologists mean by what they mean by modernity is a whole set of changes associated with what's loosely termed the industrial or political revolutions. Um, and I think you can very simply classify them as being economic involved in the developments of large-scale industries, factory production, political, uh, the emergence of uh, ideas and forms of political democracy, uh, the important role for the state. I think they also involve changes in terms of knowledge and um, ideas, for example, the development of science and rationality. These changes were called modern because they represented a complete break with the past, a different type of society. Modernity was more than just a set of structural changes, it was also a changed way of thinking about the world. A modern outlook on the world is, I think, above all influenced by science and technology. It's influenced by the idea of uh, casting light on the world around us. Um, it deliberately sets itself against the past, that's what the idea of being modern means. Modernity really relates to a set of ideas, a way of understanding the world, which is based on science, um, objectivity, uh, rather than more traditional ways of looking at the world and understanding the world, which uh, could be more based upon religion. In pre-modern societies, understanding of the world came from religion. And religious leaders made it clear to people that the things that happened to them were the will of God and not to be questioned. Some things were best left in the darkness. The idea that the order of the world is a result of the laws of God is called a belief in providence. By the 18th century, this religious view of the world was being increasingly challenged. Science was just providing better answers. This challenge, the authority of religion, was crystallised in an intellectual movement known as the Enlightenment. I think the basic idea of the Enlightenment, which is a period of social and political thought... Yeah. So, see, 
If you are late, the reading started off by saying, now we have new fashion. Sociology has new fashion. And that new fashion is called postmodernity. Postmodernity refers to the type of society after modernity. Yeah? After the modernity. Now, there were two words there just now used interchangeably. The DVD post show you postmodernity, but those lecturers in UK call it postmodernism. You know what's different? Postmodernity is a type of society after modernity. Postmodernism refers to anarchism, structuralism, structural functionalism. Remember Marxism? So another theory, another perspective. Yeah, so I used two words, yeah? Now, second question. So, after they said, okay, now we have a society called postmodernity. And the theory is called postmodernism. Does it pose any challenge to sociology? Uh, is sociology actually outdated? Because we are not in modernity, and all those theories that came out earlier on was trying to understand modernity. Yeah? So, is sociology outdated? So you see him sweeping sociology text in the basket, in the waste basket. Yeah? And that answer my question asked. Oops. The next question is what is modernity? <clears throat> As I say, you don't have to copy this, it will be posted online, seriously. Yeah? I guarantee you tonight it will be online, but it will take the admin one or two days to prove it, and you definitely will get this. What is modernity? A society dominated by science and technology. Very good rather than a traditional way of looking at the world through religion. Good. So, you need to know what is modernity. And you need to know this is a period where Marx Weber, the time they all came and tried to explain it. So, sociological theory is to explain modernity. But now we are living in post-modernity period. Yeah? You saw these three words in the DVD just now. Industrialization, the state, science, what do we mean by pre-modern outlook? Yeah, it didn't show up there. It said, "What is postmodern outlook?" It didn't use the word pre-modern outlook. But before we start having industrialization, uh, the state and science, what was pre-modern outlook meaning? Mean way of looking at things. Yeah, that outlook. So, last time we think about things, we look at things by how? Based on religion. Mm, very good. The way we look at things is based on religion. Yeah? So, that was this one for you just now. Pretty modern, based on religion. What is the idea of providence? Anyone capture that providence? No? Providence? It is about God's will. God provide. Yeah, that's the idea of providence. Just like Christians say, God give me my daily bread, you know, that kind of thing. God provide. It's the idea of providence. So things are done by God. What is then? Oh, actually I asked you to continue with enlightenment. Okay, enlightenment come right after this. I pause it too soon. Okay. So the next one, you are going to look at the Enlightenment and how Enlightenment transmits to sociology. Oops. So, let's continue. We stop at question 11. Now, can you read the questions first so that you know what you're looking for? Yeah? You are going to look at what is the main idea of enlightenment? What is modern outlook? Yeah? What are ideas translated? Now read 6 to 11. Yeah, and 
then I will pause at number 11, which means it will be quite a while, you know? So, which is also quite good so that I don't have to distract you too much. You watch until end of question 11 and you pause. is a whole set of changes associated with what's loosely termed industrial or political revolution. Modernity really relates to a set of ideas, a way of understanding the world, which is based on science, um, objectivity, uh, rather than more traditional ways of looking at the world and understanding the world, which uh, could be more based upon religion. In pre-modern societies, understanding of the world came from religion. And religious leaders made it clear to people that the things that happened to them were the will of God, not to be questioned. Some things were best left in the darkness. The idea that the order of the world is a result of the laws of God is called a belief in providence. By the 18th century, this religious view of the world was being increasingly challenged. Science was just providing better answers. This challenge, the authority of religion, was crystallized in an intellectual movement known as the Enlightenment. I think the basic idea of the Enlightenment, which is a period of social and political thought of roughly around about the late 18th century, is that in the past, our lives have been driven by dogma, by superstition, by religion, by unthought through beliefs. The idea was that human beings could use their intellect, could use their reason to explain the world and their position within it. And so it gave rise to notions of scientific understandings of the world, um, as opposed to um, earlier, more traditional ways of understanding the world. It means throwing light on something, and uh, there are ideas that in the past we lived in a sort of dark ignorance of ourselves. We should throw light on the causes of our own behaviour, and we should throw light on the origins of the changes in the, the natural world around us too. In modern societies, a faith in God and divine providence was replaced by a new faith in progress. The power of human reason to find out how things worked and improve them. Sociology grew out of this modern way of thinking. Societies came to be seen as real things, to be studied and improved. The basic ways in which Enlightenment ideas were transmitted to sociology was very much in the form of having a science of society a science which would enable you not only to explain, but also to predict. Sociologists aren't so ambitious today. They don't see sociology as a predictive science, but most of them still share the Enlightenment ideal of providing some special knowledge of how societies work and shape our lives. And basically, sociologists want to provide explanations and theories that everybody believes in. Uh, they're not in the business of providing ideas that people can take or leave as the mood chooses. When sociologists refer to modernity and cultural ideas from the Enlightenment, I suppose there are three principal ideas that they're drawing upon. The idea that society is ordered, the idea that we can understand that order through some kind of rational process, and finally, the idea of progress, that society is developing in a beneficent way towards some future state which is preferable to the present one. Postmodernists reject all three and argue that a totally new form of sociology is needed. But why? Their starting point is that we're now in another period of fundamental social change and that modernity is ending. No one is quite sure what this new society is like, or even what to call it. Only that it's different from modernity, hence the term postmodernity. But what do sociologists mean by postmodernity? Society 
today, at the end of the 20th century, when some of the assumptions and some of the institutions associated with modern society from about the end of the 18th century through to the early part of the 20th century are becoming superseded or becoming obsolete. So why do postmodernists argue we're now living in a different type of society? What's happened over the last 30 or 40 years to make them think this? Maybe we need to start by going back and having another look at the swinging 60s. Fashion shocked in the 60s. It's hard to imagine now the fascination and outrage caused by these haircuts and these skirts. These fashions were seen to symbolise a new freedom and decadence in the young, which authorities struggled to control. You'd be sent home from school if your hair was too long or your skirt too short. Um, we had to wear a skirt that was, I don't know, two, two inches maybe above the knee, and to check it you had to kneel down and the teachers would measure that your skirt came X inches above the knees. I remember walking down the King's Road with a girlfriend wearing a very short skirt, followed by an American tourist with a Kodak brownie, shooting us down the King's Road and up around several other streets saying, My God, I'll never believe this at home. <laughs> While the 60s is seen as a time of great rebellion and innovation in fashion, actually there were quite strict rules, which most people followed most of the time. There were rules for fashion. The rules were that people wore the same things pretty well. You know, we all followed the herd, if you like. I tried to lead a bit, but, uh, but there were also rules in that you didn't wear trousers in what were considered unsuitable places, and you tried to wear a slightly longer skirt in places where people might not think it's suitable in more formal situations. Uh, one week I'd been down uh, at the parents with my girlfriend and she was wearing an wearing extremely short skirt as she did and as people did in those days. And um, on Sunday afternoon my mother took me aside and said, I wonder if you ask, could ask you just to wear a slightly longer skirt next time. I didn't like myself but dad is objecting. But what about fashion today? There are no rules on what people wear these days for young people. I mean, I'd go, you know, wherever I wanted and anything I wanted, in fact. Um, sure enough, there's people who follow designer fashions. But um, myself, I'd pick up something in the second-hand shop and uh, I'm fine if, if I like the thing, if it makes me feel good, then, then I'll wear it. No, I feel pretty much the same about that. I think there aren't as many rules as there used to be in fashion. They perhaps aren't any at all. It's, it's all moving on. And uh, if you feel comfortable in something and you think it expresses something about your character, then why not wear it? It's, 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 it's like people uh, are making their own pieces of art out of the things they wear and the fashions they follow, and they are that piece of art. Today, fashion is much more a statement of personal identity and preference. But what's true of fashion can also be found in the key areas of life studied by sociologists. Take the family and marriage, for example. Even in the 60s, people were expected to be married before living together. People expected to get married in the 60s. It was the normal thing. Uh, living over the brush or in sin was considered quite shocking. Having said that, I did live together with my now ex-husband before we were married, and his parents didn't speak to us for several months because we were living together. No, no, I knew a lot of people that got married at 18. And I mean... But you were expected, I mean, when you left school, you got an apprenticeship or whatever, very few people went to university in there. Exactly. exactly. And if you got a job, mm -hmm. had to buy a house, mm -hmm. and you were expected to get married. Yeah. All within sort of seven years. years of living in school. Yeah. Exactly. You did it in a fairly set pattern, didn't you? You yes. got engaged and you saved up your, your bits and pieces. Oh, yes. and, you know, yes, sure. and it was sort of yes. very organised and you wouldn't have got married until you had all these things that you needed. Yeah. 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 And if you didn't get married, it wasn't because you'd chosen not to, it was because, as they said then, you'd been left on the shelf. But 
what do young people think today? <laughs> get married. Um, I don't really think about it. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, then it doesn't happen. It's not, I'm not looking for a husband. It's not something that's important to me. But I wouldn't say that I definitely won't get married because I don't know yet. Too young to make that kind of decision. I think I probably will end up getting married. I don't know who to or when, but it's just, I know the options always are and I'll probably end up taking it up. But it's, not an issue anymore, but I think I can quite see it as something that you would do to make someone certain that they felt really strongly about it. It's a good label to give to a relationship. Yes. yes. I mean, it's not a religious thing, but it's a good label to give. Boy, my class at school, he got a girl pregnant when he was 17 and had to get married. I, I still think about it today because he was such, you know, this chap got this girl pregnant. And Free song, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, it used to be uh, to fall pregnant, I think the expression was, wasn't it? Was you just got married immediately. Yeah. Well, you definitely had to marry the father. Mm. There's no yes. choice. But it was almost a silly thing that people suddenly said, well, they must have been having sex. <laughs> if you got pregnant in the 60s, by and large, you had to get married. Not many children were born out of wedlock, and those who were had a stigma attached to them. A girl of my age was born out of wedlock and everybody at school knew it and it was very hard for her, I think. I mean, friends of my parents, well, a girl got pregnant when she was 16 and she couldn't obviously marry the partner for whatever reason. So, I mean, she ran away and went into one of those terrible homes mm. where they had the babies. Awful. If I got a girl pregnant, it's up, really up to her choice. Um, we probably wouldn't get married, it's not. Uh, a strong enough single reason to get married, um, but it's very much the woman's choice. Yeah. If I got pregnant, it's hard to say what I would do because it hasn't happened yet. I wouldn't feel obliged to get married. I might do it if I felt like that. I might even give a baby up for adoption. I might have an abortion. All the options are there. It would depend on what I felt at the time, what way my life was going at the time, and what situation I was in. It's not that people are abandoning all the old roles. People still get married and hope it will last forever. But the point is, these days, you don't have to. The traditional wedding is just one of the options. So is whether or not to have children, and whose name they'll take if you do. And if it doesn't work for you, well, you can always move on. In the 1990s, there was one divorce for every two marriages. <coughs> Some sociologists say it doesn't make much sense to talk about the family and marriage as a lifelong commitment anymore. They talk instead about households and serial monogamy. That is, a person will typically have several long-term relationships rather than one. So it seems the Eagles got it right in New Kid in Town when they wrote, I'll love you forever, till somebody new comes along. In marriage and personal relationships is reflected in other areas of their lives. And it's this choice that's the essence of what's been called the postmodern condition. I think the postmodern world can very reasonably be described as one of incessant choosing. In the past, there were norms and rules which strictly governed practically every aspect of our lives. In a postmodern world, however, if I choose to give an interview lying on a bed, well, so be it. That's my choice. Um, similarly with the clothes we wear. Once the clothes we wore were very strictly governed by norms and rules which said what was appropriate on what occasions. If in the postmodern world I choose to wear a jacket in bed, that's perfectly all right. We are faced with a huge number of choices all the time in everything we do. Um, we don't have any guiding principles anymore. Um, on which to make these choices. So you could take the example of food. Um, in the past, what we had for our meals would have been uh, given very largely by the norms of the society in which we live. Um, nowadays, anything goes. One can have a traditional English breakfast followed by an Italian lunch and then go to the Indian restaurant for a curry in the evening. One could even mix all these styles on the same plate. And uh, there are no rules which tell us that this is a, a wrong thing to do anymore.
but there is no advice given to people on how to think and how to feel and how to react in various situations. Now this means, of course, that individual people can choose to live their lives however they wish. And that is a situation of almost total choice. Individualism now reigns supreme. Postmodernists argue that for the first time, masses of people now feel they can change their lives, be what they want to be. We've become our own works of art, to be transformed and improved in mind and body, especially in body. But this choice in individualism brings its own problems. There's no general agreement about what is understood by the postmodern condition, but most postmodern writers would contain within that discussion something about uncertainty. But it's very different from previous generations, and our whole emotional lives are very different from previous generations. And as I would see it, this, this is a source of many of our problems. It's very difficult to have to actively forge an identity to ask yourself, who am I? How should I live? How should I dress? How should I be? These are much more open questions than they've ever been for any previous generation. And there are lots of anxieties they provoke. Therapies of one sort or another are booming, all offering solutions to our insecurities. Well, in my mind, uh, the main downside would be the fact that we have so many options these days, and we are not pushed into things. We don't have that extra motivation um, that came from, from the fact that your parents were pressurising something, society would pressurise you in something. It's, it's now, it's more, it's completely up to you. So you have to find that inner mo motivation within yourself. The postmodern condition is characterised by greater personal choice, individualism and insecurity. But what's happening to bring about these changes? where people feel increasingly free to turn their backs on social conventions and make up their own rules. And where does all this lead sociology? So that we can bring about progress. That's what hope is saying. So the G, the objective is to know to predict the control. And that will lead to progress. Yeah. Now, next question. What are the ideas that the postmodernists, postmodernists are people? Just like uh, the Marxists, they are people. Postmodernism refer to perspective. Postmodernity refer to the type of theory. Yeah, so that is three words. Yeah? Modernity means society, modernism means perspective, and modernist means people. Those theories. Okay. What do they reject? Reject, reject social order. Good. They reject all of this. Yeah? They reject all three ideas rooted in the enlightenment. Okay. 
then the DVD process to, uh, progress to say, well, why do we reject these ideas? Enlightenment ideas came into sociology in order to explain modernity. Now, why do they reject these ideas? That gives you the idea. In the 60s, society started to change. Yeah? So, what happened in the 60s? I'm ask you to laugh. <laughs> what happened in the 60s? Innovation, fashion, difference, some changes. Right? Okay. What kind of change did you hear? What, what kind of change? Yeah, what kind of change in the 60s presented in the DVD? Haircut, skirt. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, fashion. Yeah, fashion change. I think that's where we stop there, right? So, fashion change in the 60s. So, and then you heard old generation, those professors, yeah? And the young generation. Yeah? Do you see the difference between those two generations? The two generations. One generation, which is the old generation, professors, those professors, represent before the 60s. Those are the modernity type. Yeah? and post modernity time. They think of fashion very differently, yeah? Yeah? What's the difference? What's the difference? Mm. Old generation, how do they dress? It's more conservative. Okay. Well, the post modernity is more open. Okay, she said new generation is more open. That's a good way to say it. More open. What do we mean by they are more open? Mm, not really that conservative anymore. They just they have choices to. Very good. Not conservative. They have, they have choices. So, it's about rules or no rules. Last time I was with fashion, people tend to wear certain type of dress to certain places is quite kind of fixed. At that time, society was more structured. Yeah, so therefore, even fashion is more structured. That's why you had perspective that came out called structuralism. Yeah, structuralism or structural functionalism, same thing. That structure, society exists in a pattern way. And what we try to understand Fashion as a structure, gender as structure, education as structure, politics as structure, all these institutions are structured. They exist the way they are, and they control us, they pre-exist us, and we are born into this structure. Now, the difference is no rule, no structure, no pattern. That's why you start having theories that came out and say society is not structured, it's a social construct. If all is changing, including what we know, we cannot really know. Yeah? That is what Weber already said in the late, somewhere in the 20th century, early 20th century. These people just more extreme than that. We can't know things because things are so fluid these days. No rules. So example, there's a lot of choice here, how you dress. Younger generation say no rules. Okay. Happy candies. Not yet, is it? Marriage and family? Okay, marriage and family. Okay. What's the difference between marriage and family in modernity and post-modernity? Anyone can help? 
it used to be uh, not not good to cohabitate before marriage, but now it's more open. Okay. All right. Is that what you get as well? Marriage in the nineteen sixty. I mean, in the modern in modernity is mass. Okay, very good. Both are very good. Same, yeah. It's about you have choice or you don't have choice. Yeah? It's about that's fixed rule or no fixed rule. Yeah? That's why they stop, yeah? Is it? Because I want to know. Are you okay with this? Right. Okay, what is postmodern condition? Okay, and then just now in the DVD, it showed you postmodern condition being defined as what? Postmodern condition. Very good, yeah? So that these three words incessant choosing, individualism, and uncertainty. Yeah, you saw him interviewing me. You know who he is, or not? Have you seen him before? Yeah, but at that time he was much younger. He was a, no, he's sharp. He's the director of our program now. Director of international program. You know the one lying on in bed. He said he can choose to do. He can interview in bed with his suit on. And I was told <laughs> that day when they were filming that there was. Um, there was some kind of uh, function going on, so everybody was in suit, and um, because they were like taking, uh, filming this, so they asked him, come, 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 and now and then just jump on the bed. They were they were having like function in the hotel that time, right? Okay. Individualism, the power of individuals, uncertainty. Now, we identity is an open question. We don't, can we, can, that's why younger generation came out and said, nowadays, there's a lot of uncertainty and, and everything is an open question. It is very hard to forge an identity of who you are. Last time, very easy. Last time, gender constrained you. Age constrained you. Religion nationality, your family, constraint. Yeah? I may have said, if I am a woman, yeah, of 40 plus, how much plus I don't think, yeah? of 40 plus, a Chinese, yeah, also a Thai, a Christian, A woman of my age, my gender, my religion, during modernity, the rule is quite fixed. And you could predict our life circumstance quite easily, quite accurately. A woman, 40 plus, Chinese, Thai, Christian. Yeah? By this age and this gender, she would probably have gotten married have kids, yeah? at least two or three, and whether she works or not, she's still subordinate to her husband. It's fixed, it's the rule. Now, not anymore. Now a woman my age, my gender, my race, my religion, can be so different because we have choice. Yeah? At that time, no choice. At that time, society really constraining. You see, I told you before that sociological theory has not developed in a vacuum, you know. They mirror the society that, they, that the, the theory is with them. Yeah? Last time, society was really much more structured. That's why earlier they did have structured listen. But now, you have much more choice and a lot of insecurity. Very insecure. That's why kids these days, yeah, 
got a lot of some kids cannot sleep. <laughs> some kids have a lot of psychological problem. Because it's all so open. Last time when things are so structured, so easy, you, know, you follow rules. Life very easy, you know, you don't have to even think. It's, it's definitely. But now, more, more choice, in fact, more headache. You know, more things to decide, more insecure. Okay. Did I stop that? Ah, I have an answer, right? Read agenda? Okay. Now, the second, next part will be with the agenda. Question. Do you have any question now, actually, so far? We are now looking at just these few questions, 12 to 15. Now read your questions now, so that later when I show you the DVD, you can quickly try to get the answers. You'll hear Baudrilla, another name, a French guy. Yeah. In fact, you'll be also here, another word for your type, never mind that. Okay. Didn't you bring my lecture, my, my, my hand out today? No? Didn't bring up. Did you bring up? Didn't bring. Okay, you didn't bring quickly, copy it down. Alright, so these are five feet, these are four questions. sociology textbook and you'll see the familiar chapter headings of class and ethnicity and gender and so forth. Sociologists argue that these divisions are very important in shaping how people think about themselves and the world. But for the postmodernists, they're just not that important anymore. Postmodernity refers to the breakdown and fragmentation of the established institutions of modernity. For example, take the economy, work, from, from being kind of regular uh, factory-based work is changing into much more flexible types of working, part-time, temporary, for example. Postmodernist theorists do argue that uh, modern society uh, has given way to a postmodern form of society which is much more fragmented, where traditional structures have broken down. And this has important implications for sociology. The traditional divisions within society, class, ethnicity, gender, and so on, were the things that sociologists studied. These were the bread and butter of the work of the sociologist. If these divisions are no longer important, then clearly sociology is no longer relevant in trying to explain them. So if what sociologists call society or social structure is fragmenting, then how do people develop a sense of who they are and how they fit into the world around them? Well, for postmodernists, an important part of the answer lies here with the mass media. This place a great deal of emphasis on the media because uh, in a world which is dominated by consumption, the media is the source of most of our images about the world. Uh, most of us are bombarded almost from the moment we wake up in the morning until the moment we go to bed by a huge range of images that uh, portray competing and uh, often very different views of the world in which we live. Media images are copies of reality, but postmodernists argue these images are becoming more important than the originals. In his famous book, The Image, the American historian Daniel Borstein illustrates this with a cartoon. That's a lovely baby you have. Oh, that's nothing. You should see his pictures. In the contemporary world, media images of one sort or another have become an increasing part of our day-to-day -day lives. It was believed that the media were rather like a mirror 
reflecting or distorting reality. But postmodernists argue the opposite. It's the media that creates our reality. When postmodernists talk about the media creating reality, they're moving away from the idea that the media represent a reality that exists outside of the media to saying that actually those two things are indistinguishable. What we have is a media which is constantly creating our reality. So how can we distinguish that from the reality we think we exist in outside of it? So for example, as a woman, if I'm defining my femininity constantly, how do I know that that femininity is only defined by me and isn't defined by all the images of gender that are constantly fed to me through the media? The two things overlap. The media reality is actually inescapable and is a reality. For postmodernists, the contemporary world is an electronic reality where global communications disrupt traditional notions of time and space and blur the boundaries of image and reality. We may feel we know the characters in soaps while our neighbours remain strangers to us. Jean Baudrillard, one of the leading postmodern theorists, argues that we're now living in a new condition of hyperreality. This really relates to the idea that the, the uh, world of the media is in some way more real than the reality that it attempts to represent. The distinction between reality and fantasy or reality and fiction has become blurred to such a point that it's almost no longer meaningful to make a distinction between the two. When Baudrillard talks about the media, he's talking about people existing in a world in which they're constantly floating around in a sea of images and a sea of media texts which become their reality. So he's saying we have to get away from the idea that beyond the media representation there exists some kind of truth. Actually, the truth is the media representation. <laughs> For postmodernists, things like theme parks, Disneyland, virtual reality games are merely exaggerated forms of a postmodern world where copies are seen as more real than the originals. For many sociologists, the media reinforce existing social divisions. The most powerful groups control the media, which then create a mass culture of conformity by socialising people into their values. The postmodern view of the media takes a very different angle and it actually starts from the premise that mass production is, is finished and what we have now is something which is moving to a diversity and fragmentation. And this is really well exemplified in the move to digital broadcasting where we have a multitude of channels portraying a multitude of messages. So the idea is all these messages can be singled out for particular individual audiences. And that creates diversity, it creates differentiation. And that's where postmodern views of the media begin from. Media saturation has transformed society into something resembling an endless shopping mall, where we're constantly bombarded with choices about what we should wear, what we should drink, where we should live, and how we should be. There's an idea within postmodernism that that's a sort of compulsive choice that you engage in. Because of the huge mixture of information that's around and available to us, we're inside. Right, number 12. Number 12. Traditional divisions have been broken down. Uh, 
media creates a new reality. Okay, fragmentation because of media creating the new reality. Any more that you watch just now that you can tell us a bit more? Um, media more real. Um, they not the distinction between reality and fiction. Very good. That one he moved us to the second one. Yeah. The first, our first friend there says society is fragmented. Yeah, all these institutions are not one piece anymore, it's breaking down. Yeah. And he said, okay, media is source of reality. Media create reality. No separation between media and reality. You capture that part, right? Yeah. It says Last time, there was some, an idea that media reflects the reality. Yeah, last time, people believed that media reflects reality. Now, people say not, not, not anymore. Media doesn't reflect reality. Media is the reality. Media creates the reality. There is no reality. Except the reality that we have created. Yeah? We don't know anything reality to us comes from what the mass media tell us, from all the images we we see, you know, supplied to us by the media. Yeah? Last time when I was a student, I studied a lot of media and it was like it's about reflection, we call it reflection theory. When media is believed to reflect the society. Now this is a Postmodern idea of media, no separation between media and reality. So much so that Baudrillard call it hyper reality. The media is hyper reality. What does it mean? Good. The copy is more real than the original. The copy is more real than the real thing. The media, the images, is more real than the shape. Okay? Now I, I told you that I'm going to put up on my video, don't worry. It's more real than the real thing. And they show you the cartoon. Oh, that's the baby. That's cute baby. No, you have to see his pictures. Pictures is now more real. Pictures are now more real than the real baby. That's what it means. Yeah? So media become so real. We are living in media dominated world. And, oops, yeah, we have done this, you have seen this, yeah, you have seen this one. This is so Marxist. This is so Marxist. That dominant group, which is the, the capitalist, yeah, through the government, which is its arm, um, the superstructure control the media that create alienation or mass ideology. The word, why I say it's so Marxist? Because these are really Marxist term, you know, dominant group. Ideology is very Marxist. Yeah. So the did you say last time? People believe like that. What happened now? The DVD say, you know, it's not like that anymore. We don't believe in this anymore. It's something else. Now, what happened to the media? Did you see what happened to the media now? It's not being controlled by the Norman group. It doesn't create mass ideology or mass value anymore. But it's going towards what?
Hey, just now, what is media? Now it is. No? What do you think? What do you see? Media doesn't create mass ideology anymore. It doesn't create like one big idea for the society. Media is now creating different type of uh, of images. What did you say? What's the question? <laughs> the question. The question is, if okay, if modern view of the mass media it look like this, what is the postmodern view of the media? What is a postmodern view of me? How does media look like? What kind of things it gives us? Like what we wear or the media? Like what we wear Ah, it gives us what we wear, what we eat. Okay? How does it look like those what we wear, what we eat? Like a shopping mall. You can choose. Something like a shopping mall where you can choose, you can pick what you want. So in fact, it creates the idea of differentiation. Have you got that? So you have a lot of things you can choose from. That's why you have a lot of choice. Who we'll give you those choices? Oops. <laughs> the media. I missed one. Yeah? Mass conformity. So, yeah. Ideology of mass conformity. That's why I said this is very Marxist. Yeah, and last time we think of the media that way. But now, the postmodern view point towards the media creating diversity and differentiation. Gives us a lot of choice, a lot of diverse ideas, lots of different values that we can pick and choose, just like shopping mall. Choose what we want to be from images around us supplied by the media. Right? I think that's where we stop. Okay. Social institutions do not have power over us anymore. Yeah? You heard that? Yeah. Orders, gender. Okay, and then it's coming gender, isn't it? Gender differences. Okay? So just now there was an idea of gender differences, that's why you saw that sexy image. What's the difference between modern and postmodern view of gender differences? What do you think?
Like what? Is she said there's something that men can do with them still? An S? No, we can. No, don't you know our Prime Minister, Miss Hing Lap, Minister of Defense? And she got her knife, <laughs> her sword, on her, her sword. Okay, what are the things that men can do with it? Women can give birth, men cannot. Ah, that's brilliant. Women can give birth, men cannot. So challenge us what you can do, but they can't do. <laughs> what are the things that you can do and women cannot do? Ah, they were saying that, you know, you can't give birth, men can't give birth. We are better. Now, the other way around. What are the things that men can do, women can do? She was helping me. Do you have any idea what the men can do, we can do? Anything? You lose. <laughs> Nothing. So, we can think about it because this is an argument, yeah? That now you don't have to come in you anymore. You know, we are all the same. And now I haven't finished my DVD, but it's... Okay, why don't you just take a break first then? Uh, 15 minutes and come back again. tends to deny that there is any such thing as the truth and in its more radical versions argues that we shouldn't have a notion of truth at all that all we can do is have conversations about the world that science is a kind of conversation about the world For postmodernists, the boundaries between different forms of knowledge have also fragmented throwing doubt on sociology's claim to provide some special knowledge of society Postmodernists argue that we now live in a world where there are only images, a permanent state of virtual reality. What you think you see is all you get. There are no longer any certainties, no anchor points for saying one theory is truer than another, one way of living better than another. There are no right or wrong answers, only alternatives. Sociological theories like Marxism, Functionalism and Feminism are just big stories or grand narratives that make unjustified claims to special privileged status. Traditionally, the goal of sociology was to produce what we might call grand theories, large theories, explanations of a whole range of social phenomena. Postmodernists reject this idea. They reject the possibility of large, all-encompassing theories or explanations. And in their place, they would uh, perhaps accept the possibility of lots of small theories which compete with each other. But none of these small theories has any privileged right to claim absolute authority in relation to the others. They're all just another way of looking at the world. Postmodernism tends to say, well, we live in a fragmented world. Uh, the, if we are dubious about the idea of attaining final truth anyway, all we can probably do is eliminate, sorry, illuminate little um, nooks and crannies of the world, not understand the world as a whole. So postmodernists are sceptical of the Enlightenment idea and its development in sociology. It's not that you can't do research, but you have to recognise that at most you're only illuminating a tiny corner of an increasingly fluid and fragmented social world. It would be ironic if in the midst of our brightly lit, high-tech society, the postmodernists had returned us to a new Dark Ages. I think the postmodern um, agenda could very reasonably be seen as one where uh, we are returning to a kind of dark age in which knowledge, wisdom, rationality um, are no longer seen as important and in which any view of the world is given equal prominence. I see postmodernism very much as a return to the dark ages. Of course that's not how they see themselves, they see it as a celebration of aesthetics, of art, of the fiesta, of, of making your life a, a work of art, a piece of poetry, etc. But when you give up hope of any kind of systematic analysis, then what are you giving up hope on? You're giving up hope on being able to understand poverty, oppression, discrimination. But should sociologists be telling people what's right and wrong with society? In the name of progress, 
Sociologists have traditionally been critical of societies and suggested ways of changing them. But to postmodernists, this is an arrogance. In this period of history, it is a very uncertain place. So individual people are freed from what postmodernists refer to as grand narratives. These are big ideas, or as uh, Leotard calls them, fables. These are ideas like socialism, or feminism, or like the ideas contained within organised religions that tell people how to lead their lives, what to think, and when to think it, and how to think it. Appropriate ways of behaving. Postmodern theory is about trying to understand what they think is going on, and therefore it's very different from classical theory because it doesn't believe in the notion of progress in the way the classical theorists did. In fact, because of his scepticism, it feels it can't talk about something called progress. We're told the postmodern age is one of choice, where we're increasingly free to make our own lives as we wish. <laughs> But it seems some people have got more choice than others. And they've got this choice because they've got more economic resources. And for want of a better word, we could call these divisions social classes. And those who seem to end up doing most of the childcare and household chores look suspiciously like what we used to call women before they were deconstructed. So maybe the rejection of sociology's key ideas is a bit premature. There's also a contradiction in the postmodern position. They reject general theories or grand narratives and then tell us that the whole of Western society is changing. However, this doesn't mean that postmodern theory should be dismissed. It's told us a lot about culture and identity in contemporary societies, how the way in which people think about themselves and the world is changing. Postmodernism has been useful. It's been a very useful analytical tool for sociologists because it's allowed us to understand how the world has become dominated by a mass-mediated environment to a certain extent, and how we actually can construct our own identities through that. I think the real value of postmodernism is that it's caused people to really look very hard at some of the most established ideas in social science and in society in general, and to look again at some of the entrenched assumptions that we have about the nature of the world we live in. Contemporary sociology textbook is a bit like being transported back to the past, to a world of rigid social divisions. We just have to look around us to see that the world's not like that anymore. And perhaps the most important lesson of postmodernity is to remind us that we live in a changing world and that sociology must reflect those changes. Do you heard the word grand narratives? 
This is holism. Yeah, brand linearity, holism, brand theory. Yeah, because they say that no one is. Society is, is fragmented. So if society is fragmented, then you need to understand pieces, not the whole. Yeah, so not holism anymore. But those fragmented pieces. So therefore, there could be little, small little theories that could keep each other. Yeah, this kind of thing will come next week. How theories compete each other and all that will come the idea of realism next week. Yeah. Are they returning us to the new, new dark ages? Yeah. If we give up the idea of trying to understand things, we are going back to the new dark ages. We won't know things anymore. Yeah. That's what they are doing. So you guys, Writing. <laughs> you don't trust me now. <laughs> Post it online. <laughs> okay. After you, <laughs> you have choice, right? You say no, you have okay. What about the idea of progress? Sociologists say they would like to understand so that they can they can bring progress. What do they say? Most models. Can you think about progress? It is my idea. It's not very clear in that, yeah? It say you can't really talk about progress. This is an arrogant. I'm sorry, this is an arrogant, is it? C. How to spell arrogant? C E, right? Arro A O E. C E, yeah. She really is an arrogance. Yes, yeah, skeptical the idea of progress, ideas so you can bring progress to the world. Okay, that. Okay, you're going to write after the class, you can do that. And then say, is sociology passing fashion? What does it mean, a passing fashion? What does it mean? Is it a passing fashion? Will it be over very quickly? Is it here to stay? Is the idea actually valid? Can we believe it or not? Or is it just like an idea that's going to to aim soon? Because just like any theory, a lot of theories come and go because they are they, they are not really valid. Is it just just a passing question? Yeah, this idea is a bit hard for you to capture. You see, it says there is contradiction in postmodern position. Postmodernists rejected reject brand theory. Yeah? No brand theory, no nomothetic theory, no holism, because society is fragmented. Yeah? But the DVD said. But they say the whole of the symbol is changing. That itself is a brand theory. Yeah? When they generalize. And say the whole of the symbol is changing. Huh? That is itself a grand narrative. Okay, I won't ask you very long. <laughs> okay. What is the criticism against postmodernism? Did you have that? Did you write it down? Criticism. Now, the question is Is the structure still there or is no more? Do we still have division between gender, between class? Do we? Yes, we do. Yeah, and the DVD showed you that. It said people have choice, but some people have more choice than others because they have economic resources. That is class division. We have.
No, this one I wrote wrong. What's that prism again? Postmodernism, they reject randomism. No, 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 not very What's the value of postmodernism? Okay, this part wrong. I wrote wrong. But you think, yeah, I have a post. We have class, we have gender. True? We have class, we have gender. I just can't let you say, you see, people who end up in the house and show look suspiciously like women before they were even attracted. Women still do house and show and men still do work at the computer. That is gender division. And that's why they bring back sociology texts up again for you to study, unfortunately. You got to study why they argue that the idea that society is so fragmented, you are not being constrained by division anymore, by gender, by class, not true. Yeah, that's what you say. Yeah, and yeah, they are returning us to the new that it just is correct. And lastly, you say, okay, what is the value of this perspective? Make us aware of that the world is changing, the world is dominated by the media. Question social science assumption. Yeah, it raises an awareness that social science must have to adjust to changes in society. Society is changing, so the value of this perspective is tell us how important the media is in shaping our reality and also point the direction that Maybe sociology is a little outdated. We've got to adjust to change it. Yeah. You know, during my time, when we take major, yeah, communication and media during my time was ranked very low. Globally study communication and media. Yeah. Of course, there was like art, screen, science really, during my time, as in Sri Lanka, art and science. Right? So I say, okay, let me choose R. Ah, surely the one I chose was ranked the highest, right? So, but they are also research. You know what I studied? During my undergrad, I studied French. I was quite fluent in French. I studied English. And I studied drama. Probably drama would have been the best thing to do with that, yeah? Anyway, communication is ranked the lowest. But now, communication rank very high. Because really, it is about the media dominated society nowadays. Media is such an important aspect. So, therefore, the study of media and mass communication is a very popular uh, subject. Okay, now we officially finish all the theories. Yeah, and surely this one is the most interesting. However, I don't see it. Ask very much, very often in the exam. I used to ask this person, should I do this one? Do you never ask? She said, yeah, 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 must do, must do. That's why I'm telling you this, I'm showing this now. And you are watching the DVD, actually, you can watch again if you like to. You go home and look at all these other things that follow the subject. Yeah? You will understand it. You won't have problems, brain pains. Okay? Yeah? Here, it just say, see? Problem, uh, social order, science, progress. You've got that. Just look at all the things in blue. Yeah? Globalization, media. Okay. Just a little bit there. The things that I have not mentioned, they are self explanatory Alright? Done? Finish? Okay. I've got some more things for you to watch. Yeah. We finished all the theories. Now we are preparing you to do this. Yeah. I have not shown you the rest of this DVD. I have shown you Marx, Durkheim and Marx. But there is another part of me. It's not really me that I want you to watch really. It's more of application into education. Yeah? How symbolic is explain education? Last time we had Durkheim. Education function to instill people with the norms and values that help to integrate them. Norms and values are such as fairness, meritocracy, 
help integrate that values is moral regulation, social integration, right? Marks. Education function to instill us with the norms and values, again, that sustain capitalism. For example, idea of authority, you know, and all these help to recreate capitalism and reproduce the class system. And we've heard working class kids, working class job, working class job. Now, we're going to watch how the interactionists look at education. Yeah, what does it have to do with, let me repeat again, simple meanings, interaction, take the roles of the others, and social social expectation. Yeah, these are the key words that you will hear up there. But, you know, okay, so, can't help it, I just have to show you the bit on symbolic interactions, even though you actually can watch yourself. But later, after we finish the education, we will pause and you tell me how they analyze education. Yeah? After education, there is another part which is very interesting and very useful. It's when they bring back again master time and, and me to analyze one topic called medicalization. Yeah? Uh, that one, after the time is paused, how the time explain medicalization. After mass, we will pause. And that will take me perhaps another half an hour. Yeah? And the last bit will be going through how to write a safe on the line. Okay, you guys wait a while. Karl Marx was the founder of an alternative structural perspective in so. The thing about theory is that it. Our social action theory starts from the individual. That presumes that we are all individuals who have reasons for what we do, are intentional beings. We know a lot about what we're up to. We're not like objects in nature. Action theory stresses the importance of the dynamic human individual, the knowledgeable human individual. Action theory comes in as a corrective, if you like, to structure insofar as it focuses on the making of society. Who makes the structure? Structural theories offer us a grand panoramic view of societies, a sense of how the overall organisation fits together. Action theories, in contrast, begin by trying to explain the everyday world in which individuals interact. Societies are not the result of some outside force controlling people like a grand puppet master, but the result of people's conscious interactions. But there's a problem for this approach. If individuals are creative social actors pursuing their own interests, then how is the social order we see all around us possible? One influential answer to this was given by another founder of sociology, George Herbert Mead. Mead was particularly concerned with showing how the agent or actor was not simply a product of an economic structure or, the, or, 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 or passive. Uh, rather, the agent was creative, imaginative, and engaged in a variety of communicative practices with others. And it's these communicative practices which are mediated through language which provide the basis for Mead's idea of social interaction. And it's social interaction which is the key to human society. Unlike the other great sociologists, Mead didn't write a single book. But his students gathered his lectures and notes together and they were published in this famous book, Mind, Self and Society. Mead was interested in how ordered social interaction was possible. And the answer, he thought, came from people's ability to manipulate symbols. And thus the theory arising out of Mead's work came to be called symbolic interactionism. 
symbolic interactionist theory is quite different from the views of people like Durkheim and Parsons, who tended to see socialization as a much more one-way process. Um, symbolic interactionists focus much more on the active role which the individual actor plays in social interaction and indeed the negotiated character of, of social roles. Symbolic interactionist theory can often be described as a drama. Society looked as a drama. In a, in a, in a play, um, individuals learn how to take on a role. So instead of structural functionist theory or Marxist theory, those roles are decided for them externally and they play those roles, these people think about the roles they're playing. If a dog were to come in now and I were to kick it, the behaviour of that dog would be fairly predictable. It would bark and yap and bite my ankles and run away. Uh, if I were to, if a human being were to come in now and I were to kick that human being, their reaction would be quite different. Um, they may kick me uh, back. On the other hand, they may do a range of other things. And, and the crucial point is what they do will be determined by their perception of why I kick them in the first place. So in other words, what the human being does, which is different from what the dog does, is to what uh, me call take the role of the other. The, the human being can imagine what it's like to be me and start to wonder what reason I had for kicking them. And on the basis of that, can make a decision about what to do next. They might conclude I'm crazy, in which case they might think I need to be taken away uh, for my own safety. They might conclude um, it was really an illustration of what symbolic interactionist theory is, um, in which case uh, I, I might be seen to be a, um, an enthusiastic teacher, uh, and their reaction would be quite different. The point is that um, they interrogate my motives for performing that act in the first place. And it's that ability to put oneself in the shoes of others that forms the heart of what symbolic interactionism is about. It's this capacity to take the role of the other that gives people a sense of self or a self-consciousness. Interactionists have likened society to a looking glass. That is, the image we have of ourselves is simply a reflection of how others react towards us. For interactionists, then, the self is socially created. The ideas we have about ourselves arise out of social interaction. Other people literally tell us who we are. Of course, we may resist these labels. For example, by carrying on behaving as if we were young when really we're old. However, in the end, other people's views of us will tend to prevail. We have a special label for people who continue to cling to an identity which no one else recognises. We call them schizophrenic and we send them for treatment. So from a social action point of view, you'd be less concerned with how the school fits into society and more concerned with how teachers and pupils fit into the school. Interactionists would be particularly interested in the details of teacher-pupil interaction, how identities are created, sustained and changed. When I see my students coming in with pillows and alarm clocks and mugs of Horlicks, when I watch them dozing off in class, then whether I like it or not, they're telling me something. Not only about my classes, but about me. And self is boring becomes part of my identity, as indeed it is for many teachers and lecturers. But it's not just students who label teachers. Ideally, you go in... Uh clean slate, hoping to not make any judgments about them, but uh, fairly easily and fairly quickly, you soon start to uh, realise which ones are going to cause you any problems, if any, and uh, which ones are likely to be the most motivated and going to start getting you your A's and B's and things like that. Um, you, f you probably feel at the time that you shouldn't do that quite so quickly, but um, the way you manage your lessons soon highlights those students that you need to keep an eye on. Interactionist theory of education wouldn't look at the structure or the institutions, it would look at the process of what goes on in the education institutions. For example, the teacher-pupil relationship. This is vital to understand um, how the pupil's self-image is maintained. It also helps how teacher self-images are maintained, and we look at both ways. So, for example, if um, students are labelled as stupid or thick, how true is it that they will be stupid or sick? Um, one way in which symbolic interactionists might approach the subject, say, of educational failure, 
is to consider the detailed interactions which have taken place between the so-called failing student and those um, uh, in authority around that student, the teachers, for example. First impressions usually carry you through until the end, and you can criticise yourself for stereotyping or whatever reasons you want to think about it, but you can look at someone and perhaps from their demeanour or their dress, the slovenly approach, that is their version of, well, I'm not going to bother that much. Labels follow you through, straight through from high school, because when teachers talk to each other, it goes around stuff through, and then it comes back and they say, I hear you, which will make up. And then even if you're not, it carries, it will carry on straight into the... All the teachers have their favourites, and if you're not one of those favourites, then you don't stand as good a chance as someone else who is. And it's almost like they look around and they decide um, which students are the A students, and those students then consequently get the more attention from the, the teachers, so they're the ones that come out with the top grades at the end of the day. Rather than simply see the child as a failure, as thick, as not very bright, um, the symbolic interactionist might be interested to see uh, the ways in which the child has come to perceive themselves through the eyes of their teacher as a failure at school. And so um, what we have is a picture of educational failure as a social process. If you're not one of the ones who's the favourites, then you're not pushed as much, and you don't intend to try as hard, because there's no point. But there's about six of us, and uh, she's actually now left school, but when she was here, she was the only one doing GMBQ. And we said to her, you know, how do you, how do you feel because this is the way you've been treated within the school? And how do you get on with like, being with the group of people you were with because they were portrayed as being stupid? And she said, I just acted thick, you know, to fit in. I mean, you go out from the school and think, yeah, I'm thick, I wasn't as good as them. Oh, I do as well. Well, I'm not one of the teacher's favourites, and, and they made that clear. They've decided, through whatever means they have, that I'm not, I'm not particularly intelligent, and there's little I can do against that, because they're not going to give me the chance to prove myself any other way. That's, their predictive grades come out of my reports, and my references to future colleges, and there's nothing I can do about it. So social action theory is rather like putting aspects of social life under a microscope and examining them in great detail. The particular contribution of symbolic interactionist theory is to help us understand how we make sense of others' actions and how this in turn shapes our view of ourselves. Even our innermost thoughts, our very consciousness, comes from society. We've looked at differences between the theoretical approaches in sociology in terms of a key division between structure and action. It's not simply that structural theories look at society and action theories at individuals, it's rather that they have different ways of looking at the same thing, the relationship between the individual and society. Sociological theories, then, are different ways of looking at societies, each one giving us a different image of the same thing. Um, it's a bit like a hall of mirrors. If you go to a hall of mirrors and you stand in front of one, you come out lots of different shapes. Well, these mirrors are rather like different sociological theories. They, they show up different aspects of society, just as if you look in one yourself, you might have a big head in one, a small head in the next one. Well, it, it's the same in sociological theories, that uh, some illuminate some aspects of society, others illuminate others. Or I think perspective can be um, likened to a lens. And a lens, you can see the world in a particular way. It's the same world, but actually it helps us to understand it from different viewpoints. The fact that there are different theories in sociology is not a weakness, but a strength. It should help us to understand that there is no right and absolute way of looking at human societies. But once theories are put forward as unquestionable truths, as Marxism was in some former communist countries, or certain ideas on race and gender are in American society, then they become ideologies. They lose their explanatory value. So in answering theory questions, it's important to say not only what theories tell us, but also what they leave out, what their weaknesses and limitations are. But what else should we be doing to prepare for answering theory questions?